Hello everyone, and thank you for joining me here today at SREcon. My name is Robert Barron, I'm from IBM, and I work as an AI Ops and SRE Solution Engineer, helping our clients adopt SRE practices. I'm very honored that this is the second time I've been speaking at SRECon. Last year, I spoke about a similar subject, SRE lessons from the Apollo 13 mission. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about, again, space, not quite as dramatic a scenario, but lessons that we can learn from the International Space Station, which has been orbiting the Earth for over 20 years now. Now, the first question uh, that we have to ask is, why do we need a space station in the first place? Why was it not enough to have the Apollo missions, uh, space shuttle, and so on? What do we want with a space station? So, a space flight is actually getting from point A to point B with a spacecraft of some sort. And we've been doing that since the 1960s. You can make this, uh, you can compare this perhaps to deploying uh, a product where we get from one environment to another. On the other hand, space station is somewhere where we actually do work in space. It can be scientific experimentation, it can be technological manufacturing, it can be a lot of different things like that. So I very much compared to the space flight is our development, we're getting somewhere, but the space station is the production environment, it's where we are, it's where we're actually doing our work. Now, another way of looking at this is what do we do with the spacecraft? You know, we have a single crew running a single mission doing something. We have a very definitive beginning and end. Whereas the space station is a permanent presence in space. The, the International Space Station has been up since 1998. It has multiple crews, missions which are changing and growing from one to, to another. So the spacecraft is something that is stateless. You will retry if there's a failure. Again, the famous example of Apollo 13. Once there was a failure in Apollo 13, they didn't continue the mission and try to land on the moon despite the failure. They said, okay, redo from start. We'll save this mission and the next mission, Apollo 14, will complete the pre-planned mission. Whereas in the space station, it's constantly continuing the work, retrying if there's a failure, retesting, re-examining, but a continuous uh, process. The International Space Station is not the first uh, space station humanity has launched into space. There are something like three generations of space stations, beginning with the 1970s, where the Soviets sent Soyuz 1 through 5, and Skylab uh, by the Americans, and these were monolithic space stations. The entire station was launched at once with one launch vehicle, and astronauts went into the space station to perform missions uh, uh, periodically. Salyut 6 and 7 started to change the configuration a little bit. It was still a central space station, but there were sidecar components which were added over time to enhance the capabilities of the space station, adding uh, scientific instruments, adding uh, a furnace for manufacturing, and so on. But the newer space stations, from Mir in the 1980s to the modern-day ISS and, Tian, and Chinese Tianyang, are modular systems, where the space station is built up in stages. There's no one central stage that is the space station and then you have more components, but you have a lot of modules which together build up the space station. The International Space Station has about 50 of these modules, each of them launched mostly with the, with the space shuttle or uh, with, the, with regular rockets, and these modules can be moved, can be replaced to maximize the value that we're getting out of them. Looking at America's first space station, Skylab, you can see how large it was. You can see the astronauts exercising in the inside of the space station. This was a monolith launched all at once with both the working area, the living area, the experimental area, all, all in one piece. However, the International Space Station, while being larger than Skylab, was actually built up of a large series of small components. You can see that it is technically the size of a football field, but in reality it's much, much smaller. It is not that much larger than Skylab from the perspective of how much 
working space there is inside. It's just being used much more efficiently. Every part of the space station is chock-a-block with uh, instruments, computers, components that, uh, that are worked with. And you can see that the astronauts are exercising, getting the same value out of the exercise, but in a much smaller area. All this in the name of efficiency and, and utilization. If we look at the construction of the International Space Station over the first 10-15 uh, years of its lifetime, you can see the components being added and added and added. Each of these components that you see is another launch of the Space Shuttle, another launch uh, of a rocket, bringing in another component to the, to the spacecraft. The first components launched, first services that the space station supplied to the astronauts were engineering, life support, and so on. As time goes by, more and more components were added, which gave scientific capabilities, um, engineering, commercial purposes, and so on. And of course, these components in turn required more electricity, more solar panels. So we didn't start off, for example, with the entire half a football field of solar panels, but added them as they were required, as more experiments and more components and more astronauts living in the space station required more energy. Looking at the current configuration of the International Space Station, it looks relatively simple. But you have to remember that these 50 components were brought up one at a time. They have multiple configurations for each other. So that over the years, the configuration, the topology of the International Space Station has been changing all the time. Let me illustrate with, with most of you are probably familiar with the concept of the microservice Death Star. I present to you the microservice space station. This Lego model of the space station is quite an accurate representation of what the space station looked like a few years ago. Each of the, bring it a bit closer for you to see, each of these components here is a different module of in the, in the space station. Each of these components is a specialized microservice dedicated to research, to life support, to engineering, propulsion, or some other component of the space station. And of course, I'm including here solar panels are microservices which bring energy to the space station. This here is a remote manipulator arm whose job is to help astronauts as they spacewalk, and it can either, even hook up to different components, different modules in the space station, and move them from place to place. The fact of the matter is that one of the disappointing things to me about this model is that the space station is changing, and this no longer represents the space station as it is today. Uh, the European Space Agency has added a second manipulator arm, which can reach the other side of the space station. Uh, the Russians have actually replaced one of their modules, one of their microservices, with a newer microservice with more advanced uh, technology and scientific experimentation. So this model is a snapshot of time as the space station was about five years ago. Still, um, it, it's more fun than the microservice Death Star in my mind. While the original plan in 1998 had been for a dedicated habitation module, a dedicated habitation microservice where the astronauts would sleep, during the construction of the space station, they came to the realization that it would be simpler to allow the astronauts to just sleep in different positions, different places throughout the space station. And then they saved on, the, on needing to have a complete dedicated microservice for, uh, for habitation. It was then distributed between the different components. I'd now like to go into a number of resiliency use cases so we can see how problem solving is done on the International Space Station. Let's start with something that is as basic as the air that we breathe. How do the astronauts get oxygen on the space station? More importantly, how do they make sure that they have enough oxygen, and if there's a failure, they still get the oxygen that they need? Well, the solution is basically multiple redundant and complementary solutions. The original solution, 
which the technology of which dates back to the 1980s, came up in uh, the first module launched into the space station in 1998, and it basically converts water into oxygen. The problem with this technology is that it has technical debt. It has an inherent issue, which is a, a, a troublesome byproduct, which can cause the system to clog, and there have been periodic failures with the electron system. 2006, a new oxygen generation system was brought up into the station based on the same technology, but it reduced the technical debt by, by creating a byproduct that required a lot less maintenance, a lot less potential for, for problems, and when there would be a problem, the easier to solve. But in 2018, uh, a third technological uh, solution was brought in, and this is a completely different way of generating oxygen, they act basically taking the carbon dioxide that the astronauts exhale, breaking it up, and creating oxygen out of that. Now, this doesn't require water, unlike the uh, older two systems, which means that we save all the effort that we need in order to bring water from Earth up into the space station in order to generate the oxygen. And since it doesn't use the same system of converting water uh, into oxygen, we don't even have the, the possibility of the byproducts that can clog the systems. Not only that, it can also have a, a secondary subsystem which can create water, which will then feed in the electron and the oxygen generation system. So we have here not just uh, uh, automation and improvement, but complete issue avoidance using a new and updated technology. But we still, if there's a need to deal with a situation where we have a problem with the oxygen generation systems, and we have emergency oxygen sources. The one is a chemical generation of oxygen using what's termed candles, you can see here uh, on the right, which are burnt, and they release oxygen into the station. And as a last resort, bottled oxygen in the station and in the docked uh, spacecraft. So up to now, there hasn't been a situation where there's been a real emergency where the astronauts ran out of air, but there have been uh, periodic uh, temporary issues with one of the subsystems. Uh, but again, we always had redundancy to make sure that there would not be a severe problem. The, most of the problems occurred in the electron system because it had the most accumulated debt. It's a very old technology. Both has... It both has the most potential problems. It has the least amount of engineers and technicians who still know how to deal with problems uh, in the system. And it's most difficult to actually physically replace uh, components, both because of the age and because of the design of the Russian side of the International Space Station, which was less designed for mix and match and complete replacement uh, of old components than the newer American and European side of the station. Again simply because the Russians were continuing to use their, their, tried, their, their tried and proven technology from the 80s, whereas the Americans and Europeans were starting more or less blank slate in the 90s and 2000s. Now, here's an interesting edge case. Every spacewalk is meticulously planned. Every spacesuit is actually built up of two-piece suit, and each piece having three possible sizes. And one of the things that they do when they plan a spacewalk is to make sure that the astronauts have suits that fit them. But in 2019, there was a launch failure, meaning that one of the astronauts was delayed in reaching the space station. But NASA still wanted to execute uh, the spacewalk on time. And the two available astronauts were both women. And the problem was that they did not have enough pieces of spacesuit available on the International Space Station to build two suits that would both fit them. They could build any number of suits of people of different sizes, but because both the astronauts needed the same two pieces, they did not have enough spares available. So what they had to do was wait for a delivery system to send up another piece or two of the spacesuit in order for the astronauts to do their spacewalk. This ended up being the very first time that two women walked in space at the same time.
Now, similar to SREs, astronauts are acknowledged as being superhumans who can do anything. But still, we would like to reduce the cognitive load on the astronauts. And that's where Simon, the very smallest microservice module on the space station, comes in. Simon is an AI-powered assistant who is uh, completely autonomous, both physically and from a computer perspective, can follow the astronauts around and can assist them by displaying documentation, helping with troubleshooting notes, putting in ambient music to help them concentrate, whatever the astronaut wants and whatever the astronaut uh, could use to help them perform whatever task they're doing. Uh, Simon can even maneuver itself, so when the astronaut asks a question and wants to display the answer on the screen, it will be perfectly positioned in front of the astronaut's face without the astronaut having to hunt and look for where the answer is. Simon is also taking advantage of the advanced computer capability that we can launch into space and the fast network times um, that we have. A lot of the AI work in Simon is actually offloaded into the IBM Watson here on the ground. So this is a, a great example of interfacing between the ground uh, and the space station. More and more uh, AI-powered assistants will allow the astronauts to perform advanced uh, projects more easily and will reduce the amount of training that new astronauts will require in order to, uh, to perform space. Now, let's look at a couple of uh, do's and don'ts in the space station that we can take from uh, for, for our own work uh, back at home. The first is interfaces and standards. One of the reasons for the success of the space station as a, as a laboratory is the fact that it's so easy to replace the experiments in the space station. Uh, everything is collected in standard racks, which means that any engineer or any scientist on the ground who wants to upload an experiment to the space station just has to create a component which matches, um, uh, which matches what the payload uh, can carry, and one of the next launches to the space station with new equipment will be able to uh, bring this in and replace it. That's the way that not only the experiments are handled, but a lot of the basic engineering of the space station can be upgraded and replaced simply by, uh, by replacing the relevant rack. That's one of the big problems with, for example, the electron system, the Russian part of the space station, which does not conform to these standards, and therefore the electron system cannot be replaced, but they have to do more and more repairs in place. Another component that's very important are, are the berthing mechanisms. How do we connect between the different modules that we hook together on the space station? Now, the Americans have their own standards and the Russians have their own standards, but we have to have a third standard which allows us to connect between the American modules and the Russian modules. Each of these standards has a technical definition and, of course, an a tech, uh, engineering implementation which is heavily tested on the ground. So far, there have been no failures. Uh, in these connections on the space station. But of course, what happens when you have four different standards? You create a new standard, which is now being in development. Future spacecraft, future space missions, future space stations will uh, probably conform to the new international docking system standard, which will allow much easier connection between uh, components. Now, so far, we've mostly been talking about the good things in the space station. But the space station, the International Space Station, was not always called the International Space Station. It started off as Space Station Freedom, an American-led project from the 1960s, formally announced in the 80s, but finally cancelled in 1993 without it actually being delivering anything. Why was that? Basically because it cost a lot of money. The return on investment that the Americans saw was not high enough. But why did the International Space Station succeed while Space Station Free didn't? Was it more engineering? Was it more scientific benefits? Was it more efficient? No. The International Space Station actually survived because it was a place for all the countries uh, of the world, or many of the countries of the world, to cooperate in space. The benefit of the space station is not merely the actual ROI 
that we get out of the space station, but the practice that we have in cooperation with nations in space, which leads to better cooperation on the ground, better agreements between countries, and overall uh, higher, uh, higher success in things that the politicians of the countries want, which might not be directly connected to the International Space Station. Politics can also come into incident management. As SREs, we're conscious of the fact that we want to learn from mistakes, not just find someone to blame, but to understand the underlying reason that the problem occurred. Well, here's an example where politics gets into the middle. In 2018, an air leak was detected in the space station. After lengthy examinations, the source of the leak was found, a hole in the side of one of the spacecraft which had recently docked with the station. Now, the immediate suspect in the case of a small hole in a spacecraft is a meteorite or other, piece, or other piece of space junk hitting it. Just a case of bad luck and statistics. That's why the station can survive multiple strikes and the astronauts can patch up any hole quickly. However, in this case, it was quite obviously not a random piece of metal which punched the hole. It was drilled. But how could a spacecraft fly into space with a hole drilled into it? There are basically two possibilities. The first is that an astronaut took a drill and drilled a hole in the station up in, up in space. The second is that an engineer did the same thing on the ground, applied a patch which passed the pressure tests on the ground and failed a few weeks later up in space. But why would either of them do something like this? It's hard to say. Perhaps it was sabotage. Perhaps it was user error, a slip drill and a cover-up instead of a proper fix. In any case, no public summary of the cause of the issue has ever been published. But there has been a certain amount of blame game going around in the press. I'm not going to go into any details. I just want to remind you and give you an example that while we always should remain technical and try to be as blameless as possible, sometimes we won't be able to remain detached from the political processes high above us. So let's go into some of the lessons learned. Um, I don't so much like the word lessons here, but more what we have in common with astronauts, I think, is a more inspirational way uh, of thinking of this. So the first thing is, if we take the example of Skylab, for example, compared to the International Space Station, monoliths are simpler, but they're often wasteful or more expensive in the long term. But still, just like Skylab and Salyut were good stepping stones towards the International Space Station, they can still be a good idea for an MVP, even in 2021. When we come to design our solution, sometimes we'll want a spacecraft for a short temporary mission, sometimes we'll want a big, simple monolithic space station, and sometimes we'll go all in for a modular space station. It's not one solution is always the best one. And yes, this is no revolutionary story that technical debt is crippling. Um, in the case of the International Space Station, they spend a lot of effort to make up for the for the technical debt they have. They have technology there that is more than 20 years old because it was designed and developed in the 80s and 90s and still being used today um, side by side with the newest technology that's being brought in. But it's important to be able to share the information. In the case of the Electron, the Russians have less than a handful of technicians who still know how to support those old oxygen generating solutions, and it's a good thing that there are so many other backup solutions available on the International Space Station, because eventually they will completely stop functioning. So, in the case of the station, again, it's very difficult to remove, to remove old tech, um, but in our case, because everything is uh, virtual these days, it's much easier, and there's much less of an excuse to have old and unused tech uh, still clogging up uh, our services. We need to lower the cost of learning, make it easier to start working in our new environments. And yes, AI can help a lot um, in that way. And a large part of what I do is help uh, our, my personal clients work together with the AI solutions so that they can reduce the cognitive load and improve the amount of, of time that their SREs are working on the new things and allowing the AI to deal with the more well-known things or to find uh, anomalies. We need to keep up with topology, 
In the case of the International Space Station, every topology change is a big thing. But in our case, topology changes are much faster, and we can't build a Lego model to represent what our topology looks like. And of course, we always need to have redundant solutions and backups in place for the cases where unavoidable problems occur. Procedures are the things that save us when we have uh, technical problems. For example, making sure that we have enough resources. It doesn't matter if it's a virtual machine or a new size of a spacesuit. We need to know how to get more of it fast and have uh, what we need in reserve. We're not developing new uh, docking solutions for new spacecraft, but we often are responsible for interfaces and integrations between different uh, components, the glue between the different microservices, and we need to be able to standardize the payloads that we're delivering so that it's easier to adopt a new interface, a new component, a new technical technique. I don't think I have to uh, emphasize uh, more how important blameless post-incidence analysis is. And it's also vital to remember that while technology is cool, the business and the politics is even more important. And uh, deployment is what keeps us going, is the new version of the application. But the operations, the space station in space for 20 years, is what keeps the business going. I hope you've enjoyed the session as much as I've enjoyed delivering it. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, I've got a short reading list here for you. Uh, first is the reference guide to the International Space Station. This has all the gory details of the station, the different components, the flights that launched it, the astronauts who stay in the space station, the cooperation between the different countries that make up the space station consortium, and much more. Uh, freely available from NASA, just Google uh, the name of the book and you'll find the PDF. Uh, I publish uh, a blog with periodic articles uh, on these subjects, more from the perspective of the lunar landings and the space shuttle uh, so far. A lot of dramatic stories there, not just the Apollo 13 disaster, but lightning striking uh, one of the moon rockets, uh, Apollo 11 having a computer reboot seconds before the moon landing. A lot of drama, uh, if you're interested. Speaking of drama, NASA has a collection of all the significant incidents uh, and close calls in human spaceflight. Also, fascinating reading, a lot to learn from there. From IBM's perspective, IBM has a point of view on cloud service management and operations. This is both our implementation of DevOps and site reliability engineering internally, and how we help our clients uh, adopt these solutions uh, themselves. So, a couple of links which will get you up to speed. Uh, on that subject. From the perspective of the International Space Station, some of the work that IBM is doing is edge computing in space. As I said earlier, the power of computing and networking uh, to reach the International Space Station has reached the level where we actually can run a Kubernetes cluster up in space. If you wanted to read more about that, here's another link there for you. So again, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, reach out to me and enjoy the rest of SRECon. Bye-bye.